The nurse is shuffling around on the other side of the curtain he drew to give me some privacy. I can see his shadow shifting about in the sunlight. He has opened the window of his office. It's windy outside. The clean white curtains flutter in the breeze in a heavy, lazy motion, like waves. Light sifts through them slowly, half absorbing into the fabric. I close my eyes. The breeze on my face feels like the soft fabric of the curtains. I listen to the sound of my heartbeat for a moment, trying to shut out the sound of the nurse tapping away on his computer and my own heavy breathing. It's steady. Damn it. Not even a week and I end up like this again. I really screwed up this time. Should have known better than to play the half-baked sports star in front of a real one. And why did I try to act brave? Like that heart flutter was no big deal, even when it was obvious that it was. It was just a reflex. To push it away. To keep it inside. I didn't want it to happen. I didn't want Emmy to see it. Uh, stupid, stupid, stupid! I have to be more careful or I will end up in the hospital again. Or worse. That's my final thought before I give in to the tiredness. I fell asleep. For how long? What time is it? I'm feeling a little lightheaded and I keep blinking compulsively. Pushing the curtain aside, I squint my eyes against the unfiltered light pouring in from the window. The texture of the canvas feels nothing like the wind did before. The nurse looks up from his work, sitting exactly where he was before. How are you feeling? I can't really tell, so I don't answer anything. I'm feeling kind of groggy from falling asleep at such a weird time. Hopefully I don't look too weird. What time is it? My croaking the question to gain some orientation. The nurse looking at his wristwatch before answering. Things seem to happen in slow motion. Quarter past ten. I try to think for a moment what that means, but I'm not really sure. You didn't answer my question, Isao. Oh, fine. Climb down from that bed then, and let's see how you're doing. Don't! I try to do exactly that only to sway dizzily when I move too fast. The nurse moves to support me by an arm and sighs. Stand up too quickly is what I was going to say. Just sit there. I'll check your pressure to make sure. My good intentions sure lasted a long time. I shut up, embarrassed with myself, while the nurse gets busy with an old-fashioned contraption in my arm. After a couple minutes, he puts it away, looking neither pleased nor unhappy. You're all right. Head stop spinning? Yeah. Good. And how are the contents doing? You didn't show very good judgment out there, Hisao. I swallowed the retort I was going to make. It's what I was thinking myself, but hearing it stated by someone else makes me want to protest. What he's saying is not pleasant to hear. It doesn't make him any less right. No, sir. He nods, still looking as neutral as he was before. It would be easy to be angry at him if I said, told you so, or something, but he doesn't. I can try and help you to keep your health, but ultimately the last call lies with you. Hopefully this little episode will be something that will remind you of that. Here, a note for your teacher, to avoid an interrogation. I take the slip of paper he's offering and then make my leave, as I can't think of anything else to say, or even really want to. Stay out of trouble, you hear me? I don't think it was anything but a scare, but next time could be different. I hear you. There's some way to get to the school building straight from the auxiliary building, but I'm not keen to find out and possibly get lost, so I go out from the exit that I know works. I stop at the stairs of the auxiliary building, deliberating for a moment between going to the dorms to get my books and stuff and going straight away to the class. The sun stings my eyes, so I head towards the dorm. The halls are as quiet as the courtyard was, naturally, since everyone is in class. I knock lightly at the door of 3-3 and push open the door when Muto calls from the other side. Sorry I'm late. Fifteen pairs of eyes turn to me. Good morning, Nikai. Muto seems to be somewhat confounded by my coming in late, as if I interrupted his flow or something. 
Judging from the rambling lectures his classes tend to be, that might be the case. I pass him the note the nurse gave me. Wudo takes it with a nod and reads it quickly. He lifts his eyebrows and gives me a kind of stern look, but doesn't say anything. Just nods solemnly again. I shrug and he gestures at me to run along, so I naturally do. The class goes on lazily. I think I'm starting to get into the rhythm of the school. I've even stopped worrying about taking notes and being overly attentive. The first days, I was pretty high-strung in class. Muto finishes his lecture about electricity early, but continues without a pause about the festival. So, as you know, the festival is on the day after tomorrow. I hope everyone's projects are going to be successful this year. Have a good time, but also come Sunday, please keep the meaning of this festival in your minds. Games and fried food! Everyone bursts out in laughter, and so do I. Yes, thank you, Mikado. But what I meant was The remainder more of his sentence is buried beneath the ring of the lunch bells, and everyone starts packing their things. Muto deliberates for a moment, but since almost nobody seems to pay attention anymore, he gives up and just sits down. It's crowded in the hallway, or as crowded as hallways in the school probably get. Most of the students seem to be heading down for the cafeteria. Normally I'd join the flow and grab a lunch myself, but today is different. Today, I've been invited to the lunch on the roof. An odd location, but that's where I was told to go. Fortunately, I managed to find shelter from the storm in the lee of the classroom door. Eventually, the torrent subsides, and I step tentatively out into the hallway. Only to be met by Emmy, who comes flouncing down the hallway like a cannonball. Hey! Hi, Hisao! Great timing! I have super extra lunch today, as promised! Let's go upstairs! The stairway to the roof is a little dilapidated, but it's clearly been used recently. At the top of the stairs is a door, complete with a missing padlock. I wonder who the intrepid individual was that removed the lock. Amy shoves the door open and steps beaming into the sunlight. Suddenly, a tall dark stranger appears out of nowhere, standing imposingly in front of us. Amy flinches back, almost falling down the stairs. Yeah! Hello. Yikes, you scared me, Ren. Wait, isn't she... Hello. Noticing that Ren is speaking to me, Emmy looks curiously at me. You two know each other? I look confusedly at Emmy. She's that friend of yours? Ren has turned her gaze toward the clouds drifting above the school. I didn't know you knew this person, Emmy. The awkward silence lasts only for a few seconds until Emmy lets out a tiny giggle. <laughs> Shrugging off the coincidence. I invited his staff for lunch. If you know him, that's just better. Oh. Does this mean I don't get food? Or did you invite him for lunch without the lunch? Um, neither. I have food for three. Nice thinking. They walk to the other end of the roof, while I stay at the clock tower for a while, taking in the atmosphere. There's nobody else here but us. I guess the roof is not as popular as it is in other schools. A few rundown benches and tables are scattered around the edges, perhaps in an attempt to make the rooftop look less desolate. The small pebbles covering the roof rattle beneath our feet. I peek through the chain link fence to take a look at the school grounds and beyond. Students are strolling in pairs and groups around the quadrangle and at the cafeteria. A few delivery trucks are driving past the school towards the convenience store nearby. Somewhere, a watchdog barks at a passerby. Somehow, when I look towards the town center, the small town feel strikes me very strongly, almost palpably. The hectic lifestyle of big metropolises seems so far away and foreign here. Nobody has to run to catch a bus like the life depended on it, or get their senses overloaded by the neon lights and traffic jams. I feel surprisingly optimistic about this new life of mine, looking at my new hometown, even if it's only going to be mine for one short year. Finding out about my illness and having to move away from home all came so suddenly, I haven't had time to think about how I feel about it. When I step out of the shadow of the clock tower to the open, I feel warmth touching my back. 
the sun shines from a perfectly clear cerulean sky. A cool breeze sweeping over the rooftop makes me shiver, but only briefly. The wind carries the scent of trees and flowers, not smog or car exhaust like it used to just a few weeks ago. Emmy settles on a bench with Ren in tow and produces one big and two small lunchboxes from her bag. Come on, Hisao, what are you waiting for? She is beckoning me to join them, making room on the already small bench. I seat myself on the corner of the bench to make as little a space as possible. It's pretty cramped, but somehow all three of us fit on it. Impressive view. Emmy suppresses a giggle <laughs> and places a lunchbox in front of Ren and hands another lunchbox to me. Here you go. Lunch as promised. Homemade, no less. I'm impressed. Wow, this looks really good. Thanks. I make it myself when I can. Conversation dies off as I set about the business of feeding myself. Taking a few bites, I glance up and notice Rin deftly opening the lunchbox and popping a fork full of food into her mouth using only her feet. Even though I've seen it before, I can't help but be impressed by her dexterity. It's also a reminder of the sort of place I'm in right now. Will I ever get used to sights such as this? I can't decide if getting used to such a thing would be a good thing or a bad thing either. Does getting used to this place mean that I'm giving up on being a normal person? Or does it just mean that I'm becoming more understanding about those around me? I'm distracted from my thoughts by the sight of Emmy tearing into her lunch as if I had insulted her ancestors. You seem pretty hungry. Emmy looks up, mouth half full, and swallows before nodding. My morning run always works up an appetite. Which is great, because then I burn through lunch pretty quickly. Helps me keep my girlish figure. What would happen if you'd lose it? Would you become a man? I very nearly choke on my lunch, trying not to laugh. It's a figure of speech. Does your figure have to run in the morning, too? Do you always talk like this? Talk like, like what? what? I think that answers my question. Uh, never mind. And so, uh... I struggle to think of some small talk and settle on the obvious question. How'd you two meet? Rin seems content to let Emmy answer this question. Someone in the housing department thought that we'd compliment each other well, so we were assigned rooms next to one another. Compliment each other? Like shoes in a suit. Huh? <laughs> Emmy giggles at my confusion. Put us together and we've got all our limbs, get it? Ah. Oh. So I started helping Rin get ready in the mornings, and that was that. I mean, you can't help someone get dressed every morning and not get along. I see. Rin chooses this moment to interject. I have trouble with shirts. Right, that seems fairly obvious. Really? Kind of? This isn't helping. But at least Emmy seems to find the whole thing funny. That, combined with the fact that Rin is genuinely curious, makes me feel slightly better and yet confused. I mean, you've got no arms. So, uh, putting on a shirt seems like one of those things that would be difficult. You know what? I'm just gonna stop talking now. It'll save me a lot more trouble in the long run. Rin nods in what I suspect is meant to be a sage manner. I see. The conversation dies as I turn my attention back to my lunch. It's really quite good. Emmy finishes her lunch first and makes a contented noise. Yeah, <sighs> that was good. As she busies herself with cleaning up her lunch, Rin speaks up. I'm thirsty. Oh, I almost forgot about that. Sorry. With a flourish, she reaches into her bag and removes a trio of juice boxes. She tosses me one that appears to be cranberry juice, one to Rin that appears to be some kind of strawberry milk, complete with pink color scheme, and keeps an equally pink box of some kind of fruit punch for herself. Rin dexterously stabs the straw through the top of her box and begins to drink. I'm once again impressed how flexible she is, but this time I keep my comment to myself. 
Somehow I don't think either Emmy or Ren are the sorts of people to think twice about that way that they work around their particular disabilities. Uh, Ren especially so. Indeed, she gives off the impression of being entirely unaware that she's missing any limbs at all. Whether or not that's a conscious decision is another matter. I'm honestly not sure. So, Hisao, how do you like it up here? Hmm? It's quite nice, actually. I like high places, for the view. Thanks for inviting me up here. And for the lunch, too. Amy grins, a thousand watt grin. Pleased by my response, I suppose. No problem. Feel free to eat with us next time, too, okay? I won't make you a lunch, but you can bring your own up here. No lunch service? Oh, I don't know. Emmy looks mock offended. Trying to take advantage of my good nature? The nerve! She giggles. <laughs> well, if that's your answer, I guess Ren and I will just keep eating lunch all alone. I'm suddenly assaulted by the most heart-rending puppy dog eyes I've ever seen as Emmy pouts. Kidding! I was kidding! I'd love to eat lunch up here again. Good location, and the company's okay too. Amy frowns a bit at my declaration of okay, but seems happy enough that I've accepted her invitation. I guess this makes us friends now. Or at least, acquaintances. The lunch bell rings, signaling a return downstairs. Rin, you didn't finish your lunch again! I wasn't that hungry. If you don't eat more, you're going to fade away! Hmm. Rin shrugs, as if this is an acceptable risk. Come on, we'd better get going. The three of us head down the stairs together. The afternoon classes passes. Once again, I find myself without a plan for something to do after school, so I head to the library to return a couple of the books I finished reading. Walking inside, I see that there are about as many students here that there were on Tuesday, all the more evident from the almost total silence enveloping the room. As I drop the books I borrowed onto the return slot at the counter, Yuko suddenly pops up from behind it, quite startled at the banging that they made as they hit the trolley next to her. Ah, oh, sorry, Yuko. Didn't mean to startle you. No, no, that's fine. It happens. A lot. I'm used to it by now. Um, can I help you? It's okay. I think I know where everything is. Thanks anyway. I suppose I'll grab another book or two while I'm here. There's not much else to do, and after reading so much during my last day in the hospital, it's become a hard habit to break. I wander down to the fiction section towards the back of the library, scanning the bookshelves for anything that catches my eye. As I do, I look over the corner where Hanako had been the last time I was here, not really expecting anything to come of it. Surprisingly, though, she's there, absorbed completely in a fairly thick book. I decide against intruding on her like I did last time and get back to finding reading material. After an indiscernible amount of time spent pursuing the aisles, I finally decide on a couple of books to get and slide them off the shelf. With a minimum of fuss, I quickly walk over to the counter, check out my books, and pop them into my bag as I walk out. By the time I leave the main building, sunset isn't too far away. A small trickle of students remain, but the majority have left, presumably to their homes and dorms. Feeling utterly drained, I head to my room to read the books I borrowed. There's been enough action and excitement for one day already. The first is Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. I know the story, of course, but I've never actually read the original book. It's just as trippy as I remember the story to be, with the wacky characters and nonsense plot. I start thinking of myself as some kind of an Alice, too, haplessly tumbling down the rabbit hole into this cripple wonderland. Okay, that's a rather strong expression. Still, the isolated location and the overt way the school accommodates to absolutely everything is unsettling. It's like another world. I wonder why I can't shake the feeling of being an outsider like Alice, despite most everyone being so hospitable and friendly with me. Turning another page, my mind starts drifting further away from the book. It's quiet. I can hear my heartbeat thumping against the fabric of my shirt. 
For some reason, it makes me feel really bad like it has since the time in the forest with Iwanako. Like I was locked in a cage with something nasty and scary. I put the book down for a while and stare at the ceiling, taking my time to shake off that feeling. Thank you. 